This video was brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Rising oil prices around the world have pushed Western politicians into some uncomfortable spots. In Europe, politicians have been quietly asking their publics to consume less, while in America, Joe Biden has resorted to publicly asking for more oil from OPEC, the international cartel of oil producing states. So with OPEC enjoying renewed relevance in today's politics, we thought it'd be a good time to take a look at how the cartel came about, whether it actually works, and why they're in the headlines. So to fully grasp OPEC, it helps to understand a bit about the history of global oil markets. Commercially viable oil was first discovered in the US in the mid 19th century, and the subsequent oil boom created a new class of super wealthy companies, often known as the super majors. By the beginning of the 20th century, there were basically five American oil super majors. Standard Oil of California, Gulf Oil, Texaco, Jersey Standard, and Standard Oil of New York. The first three would go on to become Chevron, while the last two would become ExxonMobil, respectively the third and second largest oil companies by market cap anywhere in the world today. Aside from those five, there were two other big oil companies in the world at the beginning of the 20th century, both British. Royal Dutch Shell, today known as Shell, and the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which eventually became BP. Anyway, as more oil was discovered in the Middle East, almost all of it was bought up by these seven companies, who were supported by the British and American government. Now, originally, business was pretty good, but two things very quickly started scaring the super majors. First was the continued discovery of more oil reserves in the Middle East. That's because by the 1920s, it was clear that if all of the Middle Eastern oil fields were extracted simultaneously, global supply would outstrip demand, causing prices and profits to crater. Second, in the 1930s, massive amounts of relatively accessible oil were being discovered in the East Texas oil field by independent oil drillers, known as wildcatters. This increase in supply, combined with a drop in demand created by the Great Recession, cut American oil prices in half, from roughly $1 a barrel in the late 20s to $0.46 cents in 1930. In response to this drop in prices, wildcatters just pumped more oil to try and make up for lost revenues, which just pushed up oil prices even further. And by 1931, they dropped 85% to just 13 cents a barrel. Anyway, these two experiences demonstrated to the big oil companies that unhindered drilling was bad for business because in times of surplus, prices would collapse, threatening their profitability. The seven oil companies therefore realized that the best way for them to protect against these phenomena was to create a de facto cartel of sorts, which became known as the Seven Sisters. This basically involved coordinating production in order to ensure that no single company produced too much oil in order to lower prices. And with this deal in place, oil quickly became an incredibly lucrative business. In Saudi Arabia, for example, it cost the Seven Sisters less than 20 cents to extract a barrel of oil from the sand wells, but thanks to a coordinated effort to only drill 20% of available oil, they could sell it for about $2 per barrel. And it was at this point that oil producing countries quickly realized that they weren't getting a good deal. While the Seven Sisters paid some of their revenues to the national governments, most of it went back to the UK and US. Which is why, beginning in Mexico in the 1930s, there was a wave of oil nationalization movements throughout the 20th century. Originally, the Seven Sisters and the US government did a good job of keeping them down. They successfully boycotted Mexico's oil industry after it nationalized in 1938. And the CIA even staged a coup in 1951 to oust an Iranian oil nationalist from government and replace him with a pro-US figurehead. However, the tables finally began to turn in September 1960, when five oil-producing countries, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, and Iran, joined together to form the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. 
Coordination by OPEC members helped them negotiate better deals with the Seven Sisters. And in the 1970s, OPEC members started helping each other to nationalize their own oil companies. By providing expertise and coordinating production in order to maintain profitability. The group was such a success that by 1971, almost all of the major oil producing countries from the so-called Global South had joined up. OPEC's big moment though came in 1973, when many of its members organized an oil embargo in response to the Arab-Israeli war. This embargo was hugely successful. It pushed the global oil prices from less than $2 in 1970 to over $10 by late 1973. And the impact of this on economies and gas prices around the world made OPEC a household name and earned them their modern reputation as an oil cartel. Anyway, it was about this time that OPEC realized quite how much power they had. And OPEC members quickly began to nationalize their oil industries. By 1980, most OPEC countries had fully nationalized their oil industries, and OPEC controlled a majority of the world's known oil reserves. Since then, OPEC has continued to set the price of oil by setting production targets for its members. OPEC also provides its members with a source of political prestige, because it gives them the chance to exercise power against consuming nations, who are usually larger and wealthier. This is why, over the years, more and more countries have signed up to the bloc, and today has a total of 13 members, as well as a bunch of so-called observer nations who sometimes join in with price setting. Now, we should say here that OPEC hasn't been 100% effective. For example, OPEC members often cheat on their production targets, producing a bit more than is allowed in order to increase their profits. And members with mismanaged oil industries sometimes fail to even meet their production targets. However, the organization has had a bit of a resurgence in the past decade. In the early 2010s, high global oil prices and advances in shale extraction technology finally made American shale production commercially viable. American shale producers therefore flooded the markets with oil, threatening OPEC's profitability and their ability to set prices. So in 2014, OPEC deliberately overproduced in an attempt to price out these new American shale producers. And, well, it worked. Oil prices fell from about $120 per barrel to about $45 in just six months. And many American shale producers went out of business. In the aftermath of the crash, and in an attempt to protect against further interference by American shale producers, in 2016, OPEC joined forces with other non-US oil producers, including Russia, to form OPEC+. And today, high oil prices have Western politicians, including Joe Biden, pleading with OPEC to increase production. And coordination between OPEC and Russia has made things even more complicated. Nonetheless, OPEC's future remains uncertain. That's because some of this recent resurgence was triggered by some pretty unique circumstances. And if the energy transition reduces global demand for oil, then OPEC will once again have to struggle to maintain cohesion as its members fight over the dregs of the world's oil revenues. But that doesn't mean that this is all over, and they're certainly not the only cartel like this out there. There's even talks to build a chocolate and green energy versions of OPEC. We actually discussed that in another full TLDR video exclusively available on Nebula. That's where you'll find a whole bunch of other exclusive videos, as well as an extended version of the daily briefing every single day, and all of our content ad-free. And even better news, there's a sale on right now. So if you do want to sign up to Nebula, then the cheapest way to do so is with the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle deal. That way, you'll be signing up to Curiosity Stream for the crazy low price of $11.59 a year and get free access to Nebula as long as you're a member. That's right, two streaming services for less than a dollar a month. And by the way, that crazy low price only lasts for a couple more weeks. And let's be honest, Curiosity Stream is awesome in its own right. It contains absolutely boatloads of high-quality documentaries on all kinds of topics that I know TLDR viewers will love. So if you want both services for less than a dollar a month, then the link is in the description. And if you've ever considered signing up before, now really could be your time. Thanks for your support.